Good morning. I would uh, like to pray again. Let's pray again. Our great God, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no God like you. There is no God but you. We thank you that in the revelation of yourself to the human race, you have made Jesus Christ central in the Trinity. It is through Christ that you came to us. It is through Christ that we come to you. And so through him and in his name, we ask you to be especially present in the gathering of your people here today and in the preaching of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible or a device on which you read your Bible, I invite you to turn to the fourth book in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. God willing, I'll be giving a two-part message series in chapel this week. The first part of this series will be today, and the second part will be on Thursday. And I really hope you can be here for both sessions because neither message will be complete without the other. Some of you remember that I intended to give this two-part series last semester, and I did give the first message, but the chapel in which I was to give the second message was canceled due to a hurricane. So after thought and prayer and feedback from some of you, I will be giving the first message again today and the second message on Thursday. These two messages are about something extremely important, something indispensable for every generation of CIU students. Indispensable for every generation of CIU students, including you, the current generation of CIU students sitting before me this morning. And so today and on Thursday, I have prayerfully decided to ask and answer a critical question. And that question is this. Is Jesus Christ really the only way of salvation for the whole world? Is Jesus Christ really the only way of salvation for the whole world? And the answer to this question is an unqualified yes. And with the Lord's help, I'm going to tell you from the Bible why. In 2015, one of our revered and beloved CIU professors died suddenly and unexpectedly of a blood clot. His name is Dr. Mike Barnett. Dr. Barnett heard me give some of the material I'll be sharing with you this week and urged me to share these truths with every generation of CIU students. And so in loving honor and memory, I am dedicating the two messages you will hear me give in chapel this week to Dr. Mike Barnett. Mike's godly wife, Cindy, who is now living in Texas, knows what I will be speaking about this week, and she has assured me that she is praying for God to speak to all of our hearts. Dr. Mike Barnett. So now let's look at the astounding and categorical statement of Jesus Christ, which he makes about himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, where we read these words. Jesus answered, and if you read the verses before, you will see that Jesus is speaking to one of his disciples, Thomas, who has just asked him, how do we get to heaven? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Any 
serious and thoughtful reading of this Bible verse, John 14, 6, begs the question, is Jesus Christ really the only way of salvation for the whole world? Now, look again closely at what Jesus says here. He says, speaking of himself, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Don't you think that sounds narrow? I do. Don't you think that sounds exclusive? I do. Now, we did this last semester, but I want you to do it again. I want everybody to take your right hand, make a fist. Now, while your hand's in the fist position, I want you to put your index finger like that. And then, and while your hand's in that position, I want you to stick your arm straight up in the air. Come on, just stick it straight up in the air. Just keep it up there for a minute. Do you know what that means? Okay, you can take it down now. That is the one-way sign made popular by the Jesus People Movement on the west coast of the United States back in the early 1960s. It has now become a universal evangelical symbol, which means that there's only one way to heaven and one way alone, and that is through Jesus Christ. You can go to a Christian bookstore and buy a leather Bible cover with the one-way hand on it. I remember I was on a four-lane highway here in North America many years ago, and I came to an intersection where the light had turned red, and so I slowed down to stop, and there was a car in the in the right-hand lane, just a little ahead of me, and he stopped, and then I pulled up alongside. But just before I pulled up next to him, I saw the bumper sticker on the back of his car, and it said this, honk if you love Jesus. So I honked. And the guy in the car looked at me, and he went. So I looked back at him, and I went. But do we really believe that? And that brings me to Sandy's story, part one, and I can't wait to tell you part two on Thursday. When I was a student at Columbia Bible College, as we called this school back then, I went on a summer missions trip to the Chicago suburb of Des Plaines, Illinois. There were 10 of us on the team. We got 30 Bible-believing churches in the greater Chicago area to cooperate. We all rented a big building on a Methodist campground that seated 1,000 people. And for 30 straight nights in that building, we preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was full every time because the believers in those 30 churches would invite their non-Christian friends and bring them to the meetings. Now, to be there for a month, we had to have a place to stay. And so we rented a little cottage on that Methodist campground. It was a summer cottage, and it didn't have a kitchen. It just had a room on the first floor with a sink and a hot plate. You know, you plug it in, and we put a pan of water on, and in the morning, we boil water and make instant tea and coffee and have cold cereal for breakfast. And at night, we put on a can of hearty soup and have bread and cheese and soup for supper. And so, in order to have at least one decent meal a day, every noontime, we went to a little family restaurant on the edge of the campground and bought a meal. And I'll never forget the first day we went into that restaurant. There were 10 of us. They gave us a big round table in the back. And as we sat down, I heard a voice behind me. And it said, hi, my name is Sandy, and I'm your server. So I turned around. There was a young lady standing there with a pen and a pad. And she looked at me, and she said, I've never seen you before. Are you new here? And I said, yeah, we're all new. And she said, oh, what are you guys doing here this summer? And I said, we've come to tell people about Jesus Christ. And she went, oh. Now, that began a very interesting series of conversations because we ate there every day. And so about a week later, after the noon meal, as we were leaving the restaurant, Sandy, the server, stopped me at the door. 
She said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. She said, you know, I've been telling some of my friends about some of the stuff you've been telling me about God and Jesus, and I've shown them some of the literature you gave me. And she said, now, we're not going to come to your meeting in the big building at night. She said, don't get your hopes up. She said, but I was wondering, could we come over to your cottage some night after the big meeting's over and just hang out and ask you some questions? And I said, absolutely. And so a couple nights later, midweek, big meeting's over. We're back at the house. Here comes Sandy and a bunch of her friends. Now, the cottage we rented had a little front screened-in porch, no furniture on it, just a wooden floor. So we invited them in. They all plopped down on the floor, and we started to talk. And they started to ask some really good questions. And I'll never forget a question that Sandy asked. She was seated right in the middle of the group on the floor. She looked at me, and she said, George Murray, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation for the whole world? And I said, yes. Then she said this. She said, if that is true, what about the fact, that's just the way she said it, what about the fact that millions of people living in the world right now have never even once heard of Jesus Christ? What's going to happen to them when they die? What are you going to tell her? What are you going to say? You see, Sandy didn't ask me about people who don't believe in Jesus. She asked me about people who don't know there's a Jesus to believe in. What's going to happen to them when they die? I said, Sandy, wow, that's really a good question. And what you think or what I think about the answer may be right or may be wrong, but what God's Word says is always right. And I had my Bible there that night. And I said, if I understand this book correctly, based on passages like John chapter 3, verse 18, Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, and other Old and New Testament passages, Sandy, I believe that every man, woman, boy, or girl living anywhere on the face of the earth who is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong and who can make a moral choice if that person dies without putting his or her faith in Jesus Christ, that person will spend eternity in the fires of an everlasting hell. And the minute I said that, Sandy exploded. And I can still hear her voice as it went out through the screened-in porch and across the summer night, and this is what she said. But that's not fair! Now, I find it very interesting, Dr. Lamfer, that when I made the astounding categorical statement I made a minute ago about the eternal destiny of people who live and die without ever having heard of Jesus, nobody here in this chapel this morning stood up and said, that's not fair, and the reason why you didn't is you're not supposed to talk back to the speaker. <laughs> but some of you thought it. If you're honest, you'd have to say, yeah, I, I, I think I agree with Sandy. In fact, Dr. Murray, let me tell you about myself. This is one of you now talking to me. Dr. Murray, I grew up in Lexington, South Carolina, in a wonderful, godly Christian home. My parents told me about Jesus right from the start, and by God's grace as a child, I understood the gospel. The Lord gave me understanding. He gave me faith. I placed my faith in Jesus, and I've known the Lord now for quite a few years, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'll never forget the time 10 years ago when our next-door neighbors moved in in Lexington. I mean, the minute they moved in, my mom went out our front door, went over there, knocked on their door, welcomed them to the neighborhood, asked them if we could help them get settled. For the last 10 years, Dr. Murray, we have witnessed to those people. We've shared our testimonies with them. We've had them to our house for meals. We've taken them places when their car didn't work. One night, we all watched Billy Graham on cable TV together. We had them to our church for the Christmas program. We gave them a Bible. And for the last 10 years, they have totally rejected everything we've tried to tell them about the Lord Jesus. And I believe, Dr. Murray, that if my neighbors in Lexington, South Carolina would die tonight, I don't even like to say this, I don't, I'm not God and I don't know people's hearts, but based on their rejection of everything we've tried to tell them, I believe that if my neighbors in Lexington, South Carolina were to die tonight, they would go to hell. But people who have never met a Christian, they've never seen a Bible. The cross is an unknown symbol. 
Christmas and Easter are not in their calendar. While we wait for the second coming of Jesus, they've never heard of his first coming. That's not fair. And so that brings us back to the question, how? Can Jesus Christ claim to be the only way of salvation for the whole world? And the answer is for two reasons. I would like you to write these down. Reason number one, because of who Jesus is. Reason number two, because of what Jesus did. Now, many of us here this morning come from church traditions which have catechisms. A catechism is simply a, a list of questions and answers about basic doctrine and the answer that Scripture gives. And some catechisms are longer, some catechisms are shorter. I'm going to give you a shorter, shorter catechism this morning. It only has two questions. Here are the two questions. Number one, who is Jesus Christ? Number two, what did Jesus Christ do? Do. Now, can everybody look up here just for a second? I know some of you are taking notes. What we're going to do with God's help this morning and Thursday is we're going to see how th these two things, who Jesus is and what Jesus did, we're going to see how they go together so that he can say there is no other way except through me. So let's answer the first question, who is Jesus Christ? And the answer is, he is God. Now watch, not just like God, not just the way to God, not just the greatest human being who ever lived, but God Almighty himself, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus Christ is God. The second question is, what did Jesus Christ do? And the answer is, he died on Calvary's cross for the sins of the whole world. And we're going to see on Thursday that the Bible calls this one act that he did there on the cross, it calls it the high point of human history. This is why Jesus came. This is what Jesus did. And when we realize who it was who died there, we understand his categorical claim to be the only way. Listen, the cross of Jesus Christ makes absolutely no sense at all if Jesus Christ is not God. So this morning, we want to answer the first question a little more in depth. Who is Jesus Christ? And the answer is, Jesus is God. The testimony of Scripture is clear. I've been selective because of time, but just think about this as taught in the Holy Word of God. God's Word teaches, first of all, Christ's eternal pre-existence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1, there was never a time when Jesus Christ was not. There was never a time when Jesus Christ was not God, His eternal pre-existence. The Bible teaches Christ's virgin birth. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. How can this be, Mary said, seeing I've never had sexual relations with a man? And the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Therefore, that Holy One which shall be born in you shall be called the Son of God. His virgin birth, the Bible teaches Christ's sinless life. Isaiah, John, Peter, the writer to the book of Hebrews, tell us that Jesus Christ never sinned in thought, word, or deed. God's word teaches, moreover, Christ's vicarious death, simply meaning that he, the guiltless one, died for us, the guilty ones. We're going to talk about that on Thursday. God's word teaches, moreover, Christ's bodily resurrection. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all these things, Jesus' enemies asked. And he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. This spoke he of his body. 
Moreover, God's word teaches Christ's glorious ascension. He has gone back to the right hand of the Father. He is praying for us. He will come again someday in the same body in which he ascended. What do all these things tell me? They tell me that Jesus is God. Let's go on. God's word tells us that Jesus healed the sick. He made the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. He touched and he cleansed the lepers. He restored sight to the blind. He forgave sins. Do you remember this? Mark chapter 2. We're in a crowded house. Jesus is teaching. We're all listening, and all of a sudden we hear this commotion on the roof, and there's four guys up there, and they're digging a hole in the roof, and suddenly they open the roof up, and they let a friend down who is paralyzed on a mat. They let him down right in front of the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus, looking at that paralyzed man, says to him, son, your sins are forgiven you. And the cold-hearted Pharisees sitting there said to each other, This man speaks blasphemy. Who can forgive sins except God alone? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, turned to them and said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, take up your bed and walk? But I tell you that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Son, get up, take your bed and go home. And he did. Jesus is God. Jesus raised the dead. And we all think of Lazarus in chapter 11 of John when we think of that. But my favorite story is Luke chapter 7, where the widow of Nain, whose only child, an adult young man, has now died. The funeral is over. They're leaving the city on the way to the cemetery. Here comes Jesus with his disciples in the other direction. Jesus stops the funeral profession puts his hand on the coffin of the dead man, scandalizing his Jewish audience, raises him back to life, gives him back to his mother, and we read at the end of that story in God's holy inspired word that all the people said, God has visited his people. Jesus is God. The demons recognized Christ's divinity, his deity. They said, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? And I love that little verse tucked away at the end of Mark chapter 1 where we read that Jesus did not allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. The enemies of Jesus Christ recognized his deity. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think the enemies of Jesus sought to and eventually succeeded in killing him? Why did they want to kill him? It was not because he was upstaging them with his miracles. It was not because of his denunciations of their hypocrisy as withering and convicting as they were. It was not because he was casting out demons. They were doing that. It was for one reason and one reason alone, and that is because Jesus claimed to be God. Look at these verses in John chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you trying to kill me? Do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And indeed, Jesus did claim to be God. And I want you to write these two verses down. They are critical verses in God's holy word. John chapter 5, verse 18, and John chapter 8, verse 58. We're going to look at both of them just before we close this morning. John chapter 5, verse 18, John chapter 8, verse 58. Look at John chapter 5, verse 18. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, I remember the first time I really studied this verse, I kind of scratched my head and said, so what's the big deal? I mean, I've told many people that God is my father and they never try to kill me. (laughs) I've told many people that I'm a son of God and I have every right to call myself that. 
John chapter 1, verse 12, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to call themselves the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I've told many people I'm a son of God. They've never tried to kill me. Why did they try to kill Jesus here? Well, if you look closely, you'll see that I've highlighted the word own, O-W-N. In the Greek, this word is the word idion, from which we give, get English words like idiosyncrasy, and the word idion means peculiar, unique, in a way nothing else is. And so when Jesus calls God his idion patera, they know exactly what he means, they know exactly what he's claiming, and that is why they tried to kill him. Now look at John chapter eight, verse 58. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I remember the first time I read this verse in the Roman Catholic Bible. And the reason why I read this verse in the Roman Catholic Bible is that my wife and I were missionaries in the country of Italy for 13 years where everybody is a Catholic. So I thought if we're gonna share Jesus with them, I better see what the Catholic Bible says. And in John chapter eight, verse 58, the first time I read it in the Catholic Bible, this is what it says. Amen, amen, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And I thought to myself, amen, amen? Where did the Catholics get that? That sounds rather liturgical. And the answer is the Roman Catholic translators got it right out of the Greek New Testament. They transliterated what the Greek says because the Greek says, amen, Amen. Now, the verse that I put up on the screen this morning is from uh, one of the versions of the NIV, and I, I am very reluctant to criticize translators of any Bible translation because it's a huge job to translate the Scripture accurately from the original languages into another language. So who am I to, you know, to question the translators of the NIV? But I do think they got it wrong here. And let me just say that, and I say it humbly, but I say it, I, I mean it. Because in this translation, they say, I tell you the truth. That's just another way of saying it is true or amen, amen. In fact, the word amen in the Greek language means it is true. By the way, think about that before you end your next prayer. When you say amen at the end of your prayer, that means everything you just said was true. So you better think about that. I used to think the word amen meant the end, and it was kind of what I waited for at church. But it means it is true. And in John chapter 8, verse 58, in the Greek New Testament, Jesus says it twice, amen, amen. It is true, it is true. Other Bibles say verily, verily, truly, truly, so forth and so on. Here in the NIV, it says, I tell you the truth. What it should say is, I tell you the truth, comma, I tell you the truth. Why? Because Jesus said it twice. Now watch, the double amen, the double I tell you the truth, only occurs in the Gospel of John in the Bible. It's the only book of the Bible that ever has the double amen, the double it is true together. And it only occurs on the lips of the Lord Jesus. He's the only person who ever uses this expression in the Bible. And he always uses this expression just before he makes a statement that he knows his listeners will not believe. In fact, I like to imagine that before Jesus uses the double amen, the double it is true, I like to imagine that he says something to himself under his breath. I like to imagine that he says this. Now you're not going to believe this. But it's true, it's true, and then he makes the statement. So let's just try it out. Nicodemus, remember him, John chapter 3? Nicodemus, you're not going to believe this. But it's true, it's true, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, what? Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, I knew you were going to say that. That's why I said, it's true, it's true. Let's try it again. Gentlemen, those of you, my closest companions who've walked with me through thick and thin for the last three years, as we sit here, reclining at this holy meal just before I go to the cross. Gentlemen, my closest friends, you're not going to believe this. But it's true. It's true. One of you is going to betray me. 
And we read in Scripture that the disciples looked one upon the other, doubting of whom he spoke. They did not believe it. Now, here he does it again in John chapter 8, verse 58. He says, I tell you the truth, you're not going to believe this, but it's true, it's true. Before Abraham was born, I am. Let me ask you a question. Don't you think Jesus could have said here, before Abraham was born, I was, and if he had said that, would he not have been correct? Yes. He could have said, before Abraham was born, I was, but he doesn't say that. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, watch. Quite apart from the fact that Jesus is doubtless identifying himself here with the tetragrammaton of the Old Testament, that's a theological term for what, the, what God in the burning bush said to Moses when Moses said, who shall I tell Pharaoh is sending me? And God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh that I am the great Jehovah God of the Old Testament is sending you. Quite apart from the fact that Jesus is doubtless identifying himself with the Jehovah God of the Old Testament, he is also making a literal statement. He is saying, before Abraham was born, I am now before Abraham was born. Now, we did this last semester. I'm going to do it again. I just want you to just imagine an invisible straight line going straight across this room, out that wall, as far as you can see, out that wall, as far as you can see. And this invisible line represents time. And the center of the line where I am standing is the present moment. That end of the line is time past. That end of the line is time future. Jesus is speaking in the present. But when he does, he refers to something in the past. He refers to the birth of Abraham. So here's what he's doing. He's saying, no, you're not going to believe this, but it's true, it's true. Before Abraham was born, now he's speaking in the present, but he's talking about this event in the past, the birth of Abraham. He said, you're not going to believe this, but it's true, it's true. Before Abraham was born, I am now. Before Abraham was born. You say, how can that be? Answer, it cannot be if Jesus Christ is not God. Don't you love the om omni-attributes of God? Do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the omni-attributes of God? God is omnipotent. He can do anything. God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Now, in just a few days, I'm going to Chicago. And when I go, my wife's going to drive me to the airport. We've done this hundreds of times. And when we get there, we always go through the same routine. We stop, we both get out of the car, we go around, we open the trunk, I get my bag out, we hug, we kiss, we pray. And then I go into the airport and she drives back home. And as I go into the airport, this is what I say. Isn't it wonderful to know that the Lord is staying with her and he's coming with me. How awesome is that? But now watch, when we think of the omnipresence of God, we usually restrict that wonderful truth to the realm of space. But it's equally true in the realm of time. And therefore, when we speak about the Lord Jesus, God the Son, it's not only right to say that he is, that he was, and that he will be, but it's also accurate to say that he is, is. He is, was, and he is, will be. All that he was, he still is. All that he will be, he already is. Why? Because he is God. This is why Moses in Psalm chapter 90 says, from everlasting to everlasting, you, present tense, are God. And Isaiah tells us that he is the eternal one who inhabits eternity. Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe that? So let's go back to our first question. Who is God? Jesus Christ. Answer, Jesus is God. Do you believe that? And then the second question, what did Jesus 
Christ do? Answer, Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for the sins of the whole world. Now look again at what Jesus said. We started our message with this categorical statement this morning. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And on Thursday, God willing, on Thursday, we're going to see the importance. Now, look up here. This is, this is, this is what Thursday's going to do with the Lord's help. We're going to take who Jesus is, which we've looked at this morning, and then we're going to take what Jesus did, and we're going to put them together. You know, um, I would assume that almost everybody here in this room believes that Jesus is God. And I would assume that almost everybody here in this room believes that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for the sins of the whole world. What many of you have never done is taken those two equally true facts and put them together in order to understand why there is no other way. And that's what we're going to see on Thursday. Will you bow in prayer with me? Thank you, Lord, for the kind attention given this morning. We pray for our president as he travels back to campus and back to town today. Give him sa safety. Give him uh, recuperation and refreshment from his big trip to Alaska. I pray for all the activities going on on campus today, academic, athletic, social, interpersonal, all these things, Lord, are under your wonderful watching eye. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who Jesus is. And we pray that you will help us to understand not only who he is, but what he did when he died on Calvary's cross. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great day.